if the vast majority in society are in that state of consciousness and are living in that way, they are going to drag along with them the small amount of us that don't want to live in those kind of conditions. It's talking about kundalini energy. It's talking about uh, that energy going up the human spinal column. That's the stairway to heaven. Your whole life not knowing that you are a free, sovereign human being. There's a message in that movie, which is talking about how we can overcome adversity and darkness and evil. Mark, how are you, brother? Hello, mate. I'm all right. Yeah, doing well. <laughs> uh, this has been a long, a, a long time over, overdue, Mark. Um, you really have been a staunch uh, stand upper for bloody freedom. And when I talk freedom, I'm I'm talking about the kids. Really funny old way that society's going, and you need some people to just stand up and say, "No, this is wrong." And as we've seen from, uh, can I say, you know possibly the last three years oh my god how compliant will people be so long as they can in in, in the case of mark being a um, you know well-established dj if they can get their gig uh, and yeah I don't, I don't want to go there there, there there too much but as some people will know i ran the marathon of the sands recently the marathon de sables this famous race it's 250 kilometers across uh, across the sahara we ran it in 52 degrees heat it was literally i was questioning like what what am i doing this just isn't fun this is I not, not fun for you there <laughs> But what was really what was really beautiful, Mark, was I remember on on the double marathon day, um, I made it to the evening time of the first day, so it started to get a bit cooler. I left the uh, let's call it an aid station, so I'd filled up with me water. I've still got a whole marathon to do overnight, and I put your audio book on uh, musical truth. I just had a lovely, a lovely bloody run then, just listening to all the intricacies of the music industry the esoterics the stuff that i'm i've got quite a fascination with you know we've had um can you say you know musical mega stars on 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 the show and i've always done my bit to kind of push them about yeah but what about you know what about like this 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 and so anyway what i'm trying to say is, is thank what you what names have you had just out of interest um well we we've had robbie williams on a couple of times okay um we've had uh carol decker from Tapau. um we've had the wonderful right said fred um probably carol a few decker speaking out i spoke to carol it's quite quite a while back now um and I don't think this was kind of something that like, like, that we we really covered in a certain narrative that we've all just been through to see, for example, big names in the DJ industry coming out and saying, right, folks, you ain't coming to my gig unless you've done a certain thing. Yeah. At CC, we see you. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I get it, mate. You know, I, 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 I watched a lot of your stuff and there's lines there mate isn't there between like are these people just like ignorant are, are they literally in the matrix or well yeah yeah it occurred to me yesterday just how surreal my life has become actually because when i think back uh 20 or 30 years i used to follow danny rampling as a dj i used to keep an eye on uh, stuff that he was doing i listened to his radio one show back in the day love group dance party uh, i used to go raving to baby d let me be your fantasy big tune uh, i was aware of right said fred who were in the charts in the 90s and there's another uh big 
American star who I won't name because she wouldn't want me to, but I bumped into her at an Acapulco in Mexico a few years ago. And uh, we had a really good chat and became friendly. And these are all people that in recent times I've become friends with. If you told me 20 or 30 years ago that I'd be attending freedom rallies with Right Said Fred and Danny Rampling and having chats with Baby D, who's awake and aware, and Phil Fearon of Galaxy, uh, mm -hmm. who's a partner uh i wouldn't have believed you so life's become very surreal so on the one hand i'm now meeting all these people who used to inspire me but on the other hand i'm left absolutely perplexed and completely disappointed with certain other names you know there's other dj names that i used to look up to that now i've got zero respect for because of their stance on things mm. uh i mean i can mention a couple of names one is tim westwood uh who, who uh we don't really talk about these days because of what he's become embroiled in. Uh, there was a time when he used to be a bit of a role model for me uh, because he was a white guy playing hip hop music and immersed in that culture. And I wanted to get into that world and I saw him as an inspiration. I didn't know all the things about him then that I know now. And another one is Pete Tong, who used to be uh, an inspiration to me as a radio DJ because I used to love what he did on Capital Radio and Radio One and uh, kind of looked up to him. And I've got zero respect for him anymore. He's taken an MBE. He performed at the Coronation concert just the other week. He's had zero to say about what we've all been through the last three years. Uh, he's worn his face nappy in in his own home when he's been making videos, you know, just completely pushing the official agenda. How can you have any respect for these people anymore when they've demonstrated where their loyalties lie? They're more concerned with their careers and their salaries than with standing up for truth and freedom and where humanity goes from this point forward. The last three years has been the ultimate soul test for everyone in terms of where they stand, you know, what their value system consists of. And the vast, overwhelming bulk of people have failed that soul test, sorry to say. Many, uh, well, not not as many as there should be, but a good number have passed the test. And it's been very encouraging to see the people that have finally woken up to truth and come to a grudging realization of the true nature of the world in which we live as a result of the events of the last three years. So that's great. And I always enjoy hearing from people who have been awakened by the uh, situation we've all found ourselves in. Uh, we just need we need more. You know, our numbers are growing and uh, it is encouraging to see things moving in the right direction. But we're still a long way from where we need to be. So the work for the likes of us continues. Uh, and what else would we be doing with our lives in these times? And on that point, Mark, I'm going to bring up our wonderful picture that I know you have in the background there because you showed me it. Yep. Um, this is by our, our dear brother who's also called Mark. And it's so funny that you just said what you said because I, I literally held this up to my 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 girlfriend yesterday. And I, I made a few points and I made a couple of points in a I did a live video um yesterday, I think it was, and I said, you know, these are all the legends that stood up for the children. On the one hand, there's not many there in this picture, are there? When you take the the industry, you know, the whether it's media, music, or or for me, podcaster, not that many people, which then me makes me feel incredibly humbled that I'm bloody there. There's me with my green lid on. <laughs> um Again, not a lot of like veterans in this picture, folks. But I, I said to my girlfriend, bloody hell. If you told me 20 years ago when old Wogan was ridiculing David for, you know, speaking his truth, going through an incredibly challenging time in his life where he was clearly experiencing some form of awakening and, and yet they, they, they ridiculed this, this, the, the, this legendary man and, and 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 tried to destroy his life to the point where he says himself he couldn't go anywhere without people just laughing at it, I, i'm just it, it's a funny world mate isn't it where lo and behold 
I'll rock up <laughs> and I'm in the same uh, yeah the same freedom movement and and um very proud of that and obviously I represent the veterans out there that 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 went up to London for the for the we call them protests um or supported from the background wasn't that many mark ma- mainly because I don't think they get it I don't think it's that they're bad people which leads me to wonder what would it take for them to get it how bad does it have to get does it literally have to get to the stage where the military are beating down people's doors and carrying out their children in the middle of the night with mm. tanks rolling down the street does it really have to get that bad you know it's been so blatant so obvious these past 3 years the class the network the the types of organizations and individuals that run the world and what their ultimate agenda is it can't get any more bloody blatant if it beat you around the head with a baseball bat while screaming through a bullhorn i am tyranny i am tyranny i still feel like uh, certain people wouldn't get it so that picture that you just showed there is a historical document for these times and people can look back to that image decades or centuries from now and see a bunch of people who were prepared to stand up for what they knew to be right i know that many people will have their idea as to who in that picture constitutes a gatekeeper or a shill uh, we get that all the time with uh, the prominent names in this scene everyone's going to have their own opinion on that but i'm also very humbled to be in that picture because there's not that many individuals there and to have made the grade is uh, is an incredible thing i did a talk at the weekend at Hope Sussex for the Uprise and Shine conference. And I ended it on a sort of positive note for the audience by asking them to imagine maybe a hundred years from now, a future generation looking back on life in the 2020s and studying what it was like to be alive in these times, to have gone through what we all have these past three years. And uh, we are the generation that is charged with the responsibility of turning this situation around so that there are going to be people in a hundred years that are free enough to be able to look back on these times and wonder what it was like. So we have been given an incredible responsibility and it's absolutely imperative that we don't squander it because it's those of us who are adults in the 2020s that are going to determine where humanity goes from here, whether it goes into complete abject tyranny and human slavery. And if we allow it to get to a certain point, it will become irreversible. The infrastructure that will get put into place will be so far advanced that you won't be able to turn it back. We'll all be living in bloody gulags if we allow it to come to that. Or is this going to be humanity's greatest moment are we going to lead the species into a new era of higher minded free living where we truly embrace personal sovereignty and recognize our true nature as free beings uh shake off evil shake off darkness put it down refuse to cooperate with it in our mass numbers which way is it going to go we are the ones who collectively get to decide. And the way that the dynamics of natural law in the universe work are to dish out appropriate consequences for the behaviours that we collectively choose and individually. You can see it on an individual basis in your own life. If you make really bad decisions and if you do things which are morally wrong and which cause harm, just wait and see what happens to you. Wait and see if you're going to live a happy, fulfilled life or whether your life becomes chaotic and uh, a mess. And that also happens collectively on a mass basis. So when a group of people, whether it's uh, a community, whether it's a nation or whether whether it's the entire world, embraces behaviours and value systems and thought patterns which aren't in alignment with right action, morality, wait and see what happens to that group, to that community, to that 
population. It's the same thing, you know. If you exude ignorance and apathy and cowardice, you're going to reap the appropriate consequences for those kind of behaviours on a mass basis. And the unfortunate thing is that if the vast majority in society are in that state of consciousness and are living in that way, they are going to drag along with them the small amount of us that don't want to live in those kind of conditions, who do stand for right action and freedom and morality. We're going to be pulled along and dragged down with the masses, and we don't deserve it. You might make an argument that they do, but we don't, because we've taken the personal responsibility to stand in truth and right action. So it becomes our responsibility, our duty to try and influence the masses to come over onto the side of truth so that they don't drag everyone down with them into the mire. That's why our work is so important in these times. Mm. When you have these understandings, when you've taken on this knowledge, you can't sit around watching TV, watching the football, going shopping, going to McDonald's. You can't do that because you realize what a responsibility you have to do whatever you can to turn this situation around. That's what motivates guys like us. That's what motivates everyone that's out there attending these freedom rallies, organizing these events, organizing conferences, meetup groups, writing books, doing documentary films, doing public talks, running blog sites, whatever the contribution is that people are making, they're feeling that same sense of motivation that we do. And they realize that uh, we're up against a deadline here. Time is not on our side. But having said all of that, the freedom that we seek absolutely can still be achieved if the will is there. So the will has to be there on a collective basis. There has to be a significant proportion of us in society to influence the way events play out. And it can still work in our favour. But we have a lot of work on to win over as many as we can into our ranks. The analogy is that we're out, out there on a battlefield, on the front line, fighting this war, and we need more troops on our side. At the moment, there's not enough. So we need to call more onto the battlefield so that we can win this one. And that's what we're faced with. That's the analogy. That's the metaphor for what life is like in 2023, right? Very well put, Mark. Very well put. And I just want to add to that and say it's not just about fighting for for true freedom and, and the abolition of the slavery that, that we are heading rapidly towards. Indeed, you know, there's machinations of it all around us all all the time at the moment but it's also about individuals setting themselves free not just from the matrix but from uh, off the top of my head from the ego trap so like you said i mean you take the music industry i could take the military industry um where were they mark you know, come on, Ant Middleton, bless him, and he's he's he, he's a lovely guy. And I've had a, a couple of interactions, albeit I think over text with Ant, but he tried to come out and say when when the thing started, hey, I don't let this change my routine. I still go up and I hug people in the airport when they, you know, he, boom, what happened? Was it Channel Four? I think they did the SAS. Era. They, you know, they they they. They, they axed him. And I'm, what I'm saying, friends, is to then kowtow to the agenda and go, okay, well, I tried. Well, what it means is, Mark, isn't it, that you're living in fear. So you're living in your ego self, right. your birth certificate identity, basically. Right. And you're going to continue to live your whole life not knowing that you are a free, sovereign human being. The ego is just a thing, 
you know, part of human human evolution. You can actually take that and put it to one side. This is called meditation, where you you take yourself away from your birth certificate identity and you experience genuine one hundred percent freedom with your connection with universe. Some people call that God, you know, whatever. But to go your whole life going, well, no, you know, well, I'll, I'll, you know, they're wearing all this stuff in Tesco's. I'm, I'm just, it, yeah. you, you're never going to experience the beauty of freedom and 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 not living in fear. Hey, yeah, it's a life opportunity squandered, and we are free, sovereign human beings for as long as we're in these bodies having these experiences. But there's going to come a point where we're going to transition. People call it dying, but all that happens really is the consciousness leaves the body and goes back to source where it came from, the spirit yeah. world. And we continue on. So imagine reviewing your life, your higher self, looking back on what you did with the opportunities that were afforded to you, with the body that you found yourself in, in the part of the world you found yourself in, in the profession you found yourself in, with the people you found yourself with. And reflecting on how you kowtowed to uh, the system after maybe putting up a bit of a fight, but then giving into fear or concerns for your salary or whatever it may have been, and then just falling back into line. Imagine how disappointed you're going to be with yourself. And also there's going to be karma that we're going to reap. There are different names for it, you know, in certain traditions it's referred to as karma but i think everyone knows what we're talking about here mm. it's payback for the choices that you made for how you lived your life again it's consequentialism cause and effect you can call it any of these things but um if we don't learn the lessons that we come into these lives to live and if we give in to fear instead of standing for truth freedom justice love then there's a very strong chance i feel that we're going to have to come back, reincarnate into a new body, because this dynamic is real, as far as I'm concerned, mm. and go through this shit all over again. Now, who would want to make the choice to come back to this hell world when you actually have the opportunity to transcend it and learn your lessons, evolve, grow, and move on to a, not, a, a different form of consciousness? And I feel the lives that we're all living right now are an opportunity for our souls to undergo that experience. You know, there are metaphysical levels to this. If there are atheists watching, then you're not going to get it. You're just not going to uh, resonate with what I'm saying here. But anyone with any kind of spiritual leanings and a recognition that life goes on beyond the physical bodies that we find ourselves in currently, then maybe this message will resonate. So the ultimate message here is just don't squander these opportunities. Uh, everyone's got the chance to stand on the right side of history now. We are going to be judged by future generations and everyone's going to be remembered. I've been saying this since the beginning of 2020 when I first started making my videos, commenting week by week on the madness that we found ourselves living through. I said from day one that history is being written, that creation is watching, and everyone is going to be judged based on what side of the fence they chose to stand on. Do you want to go down in history? Do you want to go down in the Akashic records, if you accept that uh, mm -hmm. consciousness, uh, that, that uh, idea? as someone who just went along to get along, who helped to prop up these tyrannical agendas because you didn't want any hassle or trouble in your life? Or do you want to go down as someone who stood for what they knew to be right and who stood in opposition to evil and darkness? Pretty much a no-brainer, isn't it? And, uh, mate, you've epitomized the answer to that. <laughs> And I've done my best to as well. Um, I love my my whole thing now, Mark, and this is sets this podcast aside from I would say almost every other like chat show podcast. There's a few 
great podcasts out there that spe- specifically focus on the spiritual battle. And there's some wonderful channels. John St. Julian, who I tip my hat off to, I've learned an awful, awful lot from John. Um, but, I mean, just to pick up on on, on your point, we have fleet free flowing energy through us, don't know, we, uh, don't we? Which is in tune with this incredible existence. They call it the the, um, the universe, and and from that we can manifest manifest a state of paradise, which is what I like to think I've got to. I'm not saying I don't have challenges, folks. I'm not saying. My ego doesn't get to me at times, and I get upset when someone says something hurtful to me. But but what I realize is that these are all blockers for this free flowing energy. And when I when I fall down and I go back to old habits, boom! I'm literally putting this this blocker between me and everything this life has to man. Uh, to manifest, which is why the chat that Mark and I are having is so important. It's so important to realize if, you know, if you live in fear, that's an ego mechanism. It's that you're worried about something or worried about, for example, something someone might think about you. If you're a celebrity, that might be your, your great, 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 great public. But what that essentially is doing is sealing you, um, into your lower dimensional, lower dimensional self. Um, probably getting a bit deep here, folks. So I'll, I'll, I'll cut out of this, but I say this because I know there's people out there that are starting to grasp this. And I genuinely believe, because I look at all the, you know, look at a lot of YouTube channels and all they're really doing is selling people on fear. They're triggering, um, triggering endorphins in their brain that are addicted to that stimulation of fear. This is what they're doing to us next. Oh my God. They did. And I, I really feel the the way out of this mark is to, is, is what you've just said is to understand the karmic kind of principles, um, Hmm. and understand like Sun Tzu said, the art of war, very great, but you can download it free for folks on audiobook. It's a great listen. But what did he say? He said, understand your enemy. And what, is imperative there. If you want to do that, you need to know what their tactics are and their tactics are fear, fear, control, and making you feel bad about yourself. Ironically, and Mark and I are going to come on to discuss one of their biggest um, tools to do that is the music industry. How many young women have been damaged for life because they haven't got the right size boobies as Beyonce or yeah. or they think the way to go through life is to twerk your your butt into a bloke's face. It, 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 sorry, Mark, so it's sort of going off a bit on there on one, but I, I, I just I, I hope it I hope it resonates with someone, you know? Yeah. Well, fear is the key, which was the title of an Alistair McLean novel that got made into a film. So he obviously knew a thing or two. That's how they do it. It's fear based mind control. They do it through the mainstream media. They do it through popular culture and entertainment. They do it through everything, through the military, of course, through the world of uh, politics and academia. They want people afraid uh, because they're much easier to control then. So we have to transcend the fear. And I'm not saying I don't get uh, afraid from time to time. You know, I experience fear just as much as anyone else. It just becomes a case of transcending that and keeping your focus on the big picture. So if you've got maybe 20 or 30 years left in life, you know, I mean, maybe I've got 30 years tops. You've got to think about whether it's worth squandering opportunities that are available to you in that time and giving into fear versus eternity and what lies beyond these lives, you know. And like I said earlier, it's a no brainer. The answer has to be, well, then I have to step up and do all I can. And you have to find ways of breaking through the fear, whatever form that may take. And a simple way of doing that is just to think about what life is going to be like in society 
for our own children, their generation and their children's generation. If we don't step up right now, while well, we've still got the opportunity and put down what we know to be the future plans of this so-called elite ruling class, because they make no uh, bones about it. They're very open with what they plan to do. They tell us about it in advance. Even something as simple as these 15 minute cities. If people just think about what the daily reality is going to be like of living in one of those nightmare scenarios where your every movement is tracked, where you have to keep a tab of how many days that year you've left a certain line on a map, because if you go over that number of days, you're going to get a fine. Uh, and then if they link that to the social credit system that they're trying to bring in, you'll get a bad mark against your name, against your account, and your number of credits will go down. And that will affect your ability to get access to certain products and services. You're going to be surveilled and monitored everywhere. Your every purchase is going to be tracked if everything goes cashless, which is something else they're trying to bring in. If you pay for everything digitally, they're going to know what you eat, what you drink, whether you buy cigarettes, you know, uh, where you go on your holidays, everything about you. How pleasant is it going to be to live in that kind of society? Nobody would want that. And we still have the opportunity to prevent that from happening if we rise up in our mass numbers and make it abundantly clear that, that we're not having it, that we do not consent. Again, we need more numbers. We need more on our side. And I don't know what it's going to take. I guess things are just going to have to get that much worse for everyone to motivate the sufficient numbers. As you say, in every field, in every profession, some have stepped up. So there's some military veterans, some DJs have stepped up, not many. Uh, some musicians have stepped up, again, not many. Some doctors, uh, I guess, of all groups, it's medical doctors and medical professionals that have stepped up the most because of the obvious ramifications of these agendas. So there's a few from each field. There's a few politicians, you know, but where are the others? What are they thinking? Do they think that by keeping quiet and not rocking the boat and not affecting their salaries and their pension plans, things are somehow going to magically get better. Everything's going to improve. Everything's going to go away. You see, I think people have been lulled into a false sense of security by the fact that the most obvious overt elements of the agenda of the past three years have gone away. So the threat is not as in your face as it was in 2020 or 2021. But all that's happened is that the threat has morphed and it's changed its appearance and it's changed its nature. It's still there. It's just taken on a different shape. And we have to remain alert and vigilant to know the form that the threat is now taking. It's there in the shape of 15 minute cities. It's there in the shape of the threat of digital currency replacing cash. It's there in these various social engineering agendas that are being done, uh, particularly targeting children. Some of the stuff that's being talked to them in schools is still there. It's still very insidious. So we have to remain alert as to what we're up against. And again, the responsibility falls on the likes of us to get more numbers on our side. I keep going back to that because that's key to how we get out of this. Once we reach a critical mass tipping point, then things will be irreversible. Things then start to work in humanity's favour instead of in the favour of these sick, psychopathic, so-called elites. We have to get to that point. I don't know where that lies. I don't know whether it's a few months away. I don't know whether it's a few years away. I don't know whether it's outside of our lifetimes. Either way, we are faced with responsibilities to creation, which go beyond any salary or pension plan or mortgage. Mark, yeah. I just want to make the point. We will get there, folks. All right. I absolutely have no doubt. We're headed there. We're headed in the right direction. Yes. I'm going to keep talking what I talk because 
uh, 53 years of experimenting with substances which led to chronic mental health traveling silly adventures and running across debt you know you I'm, sound like a dj <laughs> I actually was a DJ in China, um, Mark. I won't. I won't diversify onto that. But uh, oh, wow. okay. yes, it was. A, I'll, I'll tell you about that perhaps after the show. But yeah, I think it, it, one of my beautiful playing music, beautiful house music, and again we'll come on to this. But you can see how they clamp down on it because what was it about? It's about love, wasn't it? It was about Mark and I may never have met each other. Yet we'd sit down on a club floor, 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 maybe, you know, share share something together. And I love him. He loves me. Cuts through all the class barrier, cuts through all the years of indoctrination that you've had from school. And you realise, do you know what? People are bloody lovely. They are just bloody lovely. And we just all want to get along. We all want to get along. A couple of points I'll pick up on there, Mark, is... Um, not just the measures you mentioned, like the digital currency, the cameras, the um, um, the, the the fifteen minute. Obviously, still a major issue is the fact that the majority are programmed by a mainstream media because they willingly volunteer to pay pay them money <laughs> every every year. Which I I congratulate anybody uh, who doesn't do that anymore. Um. But there's some realities here, Mark. This isn't like a future scenario. I know yourself and myself have been heavily censored in terms of what we're allowed to say on the various different platforms. I'm on a I'm I'm a public figure, haha. Folks, birth certificate identity nonsense. I mean nothing by it, but I, I have a blue tick on Facebook, all right? I also am on my final warning on Facebook, even though I've never had any warning ever before, because my my, uh, my wonderful producer put a tiny clip of me and uh, Tommy. Everyone knows the Tommy I'm referring to. Tommy and I had a chat. And do you know what? Because I do what I do, we had a beautiful chat and we talked about love and humanity and changing opinions as we get older. It was so valuable. But of course, boom, the uh, the older censorship brigade don't they don't care about that. They are afraid of certain messages getting out there. They're afraid of certain information being traded and they're not coming from a position of strength. You know, if we go back into sort of military speak again war tactics does uh a side in a battle come from a place of strength and and winning if they need to resort to dirty tactics like that or does it rather suggest that they're in a position of weakness they're coming from a place of cowardice and they're terrified of being exposed and losing the fight i would suggest it's the latter so when these joker clown platforms get rid of us and try to censor our messages like that it indicates that they are afraid of us they do fear the messages and the knowledge that we seek to share and they will resort to dirty snidey snivelly little bitch ass tactics to prevent that from getting out mm. and the point uh, uh, an additional point i was making there mark is you know for people that think when you rock up to pay for your groceries and they say, I'm sorry, Mr. Smith, uh, your credit is no longer accepted. Um, they're not going to say this in Tesco, folks, but for for the example, the checkout girl goes, oh, were you a, pro uh, a protest in London last last? It affects you, folks. It's affecting me now. I wouldn't say that, that, that a certain video platform is my livelihood, but it does pay for another, um, you know, it pays for our production fees. Well, as Tesco themselves say, every little helps, right? Yes. But Mark, I, I could be in a very different boat tomorrow if I woke up 
and I've been taken down and we've had warnings and, and it's a constant, again, you know, I don't fear it because I don't do fear. If I woke up tomorrow and all of my life was different, do you know what? I laugh my ass off, hug my family smart and smile and go, right, what's next? But my point is, is powerful stuff. It does affect you folks. Don't think that, oh yeah, but you know, so long as you toe the line, digital currency, you know, it, it will affect us. But on that point, Mark, listen, you're my guest. I, I'm i fascinated to hear actually your story. You're very brave um, and, and honourable doing what you do, speaking out. But you're Mark Devlin. You're a bloody DJ. I, I blagged my way as DJ of the biggest club in southern China. <laughs> I taught myself to DJ literally i went live in a nightclub in hong kong and went right hang on i've seen me mates you know i've met brandon block and alex and and they they have this thing on one ear don't they that's not why i've got a one ear now folks it's just that it gives me a sense of balance if i can hear out this ear. but anyway i went into me nightclub it's called the big apple in hong kong roy if you're watching he was the manager at the time roy said yeah chris get down there and all I wanted to do was write down the names of the tracks, Mark, because I danced to them all throughout the dance scene, loved it. I, I didn't know what their names were. So I went in the DJ box. I'm starting to write down the names. And the Filipino band that was playing, which is a Hong Kong tradition, finished. The lead singer came over to the DJ booth and he went, uh, excuse me, over to you. Oh. Okay, right. <laughs> so I queued up a record. I got another one waiting to go. I remembered the one ear thing. Right, that's got to be the slider between that one and that one. A and B, that's me, my, that's me head right. I, I think I've got this. You sure anyway, did blag that one. <laughs> and it ended up that I went to China for this interview and I ended up um, getting the job. But it's a whole another thing. Folks, if you want to read more about it, it's in, in my memoir, They're Eating Smoke. But what I want to say is just big up to you, mate. You know, DJing is an art. It, it, it's it, 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 it's it's one thing playing the old records like we did at kids, uh, uh, did as kids, the old, was it 45s, but you could put a stack of 10 of them on your little red player. What got you in? What got you into playing music? I've always been someone that loved music. It's been part of my life path. I get quite philosophical about it these days. And I just conclude that I came into this life to do the work that I'm doing now. And in order to be doing that, I had to be someone that fell in love with music and that studied it and that just knew a lot about the scene so that I would develop the passion to want to become a DJ. That's what it was. You know, I spent my childhood uh, listening to the top 40 on Radio 1 on a Sunday where I heard all the chart hits. Uh, that's what made me fall in love with pop music first off. And then in the 80s, I had a school friend. I grew up in uh, a small market town in West Oxfordshire, which is not renowned for its musical heritage. You know, but there was this one kid at school that was into black dance music and he used to bring a radio cassette into school and he used to play like the soul funk hip hop of the day. And I was captivated by that. It was so different to anything else I'd ever heard. And I got into sort of black music, black dance music, and then house music came along. So this was uh, mid 80s, just ready for the explosion in electronic and house music which was pioneered by the acid house rave scene of the uk second summer of love so called 1988-89 and so that got me into dance music but at the same time i gravitated towards hip-hop i loved rap and hip-hop uh, listening to the aforementioned tim westwood when he was on capital radio the capital rap show that got me into that whole culture and when i became a dj I wanted to play that music. So I veered more towards the rap, the hip hop, the R&B, the reggae, that sort of stuff. I always kept an ear open for the house and dance music. I was always into that. I always knew a lot, a lot about it. But I just became a DJ who was recognized for playing R&B and hip hop parties. So that became my full time job. I was very fortunate enough to be able to do that 
for a livelihood for around about 20 years. I did radio shows on uh, different stations in the UK, and I was fortunate enough to be able to travel up and down the length and breadth of the UK and internationally to DJ. Never actually played in mainland China. I did a couple of gigs in Taipei, Taiwan, mm-hmm. and uh, I did a couple in Tokyo. I played in Singapore, but I never actually made it to China. But, you know, happy days for as long as they lasted. But towards the end of that career, so we're getting to around about sort of 2006, 2007, I'd become something of a jobbing DJ. So whereas previously I was playing guest spots at really great clubs and promoters were booking me to play uh, these great events, by 2006, I'd taken jobs at various bars and different sort of static venues where I was just turning up week after week and playing the same old tunes to the same old crowd. And I was starting to get very bored with it. Also, the music had changed by that point as well. I got into the game in the 90s. Everything in the 90s was so different to what it is now and so much better, I would say. You know, hip hop and rap music was so much better. House and dance music was so much better. Movies and films were so much better. And it really started to diminish by sort of 2006. I was just getting very uninspired by it all. And I decided that I just wanted to change profession because I wasn't getting the same buzz, the same thrill out of DJing that I once did. And I guess that was partly what inspired me to go on the path of research that I did. I was reading books by the likes of David Icke. I'd been put on to the film Zeitgeist, the first Zeitgeist movie, by Danny Rampling, actually. We were stranded in an airport in Riga, Latvia one time when we both played the same festival event. And we got chatting and uh, Danny put me onto this amazing film Zeitgeist, which when I watched it, it blew my mind. It completely changed my worldview. And so right about these times, 2007, 2008, I was starting to reevaluate my entire perception of what this world was all about. And one thing led to another, and that's what put me on the path to researching the true nature of the music industry. The first major result of that was my first Musical Truth book, which I self-published in early 2016. And by that point, that was based on five years worth of pretty intensive research into what the music industry is really used for. And then I put out another two volumes of Musical Truth. I put my allegorical novel, The Cause and the Cure, out in between volumes two and three. And over the course of the past, it's about 12, 13 years now, I've just done countless podcasts, videos, interviews such as this. I've got into doing live talks and conferences. I do one of those pretty much every weekend now. Uh, I'm continuing to write books. And I've just settled on any way that I possibly can to get these important messages out there to as many people as possible. And people are often very kind and gracious enough to say to me, oh, it's amazing what you do. It's incredible. And I really don't see it that way. I take a very humble view of what I do. I think everyone should be doing this. Everyone who wakes up to truth and who realizes what humanity is up against in terms of this insidious control system that we have should be doing something similar to this, whether it's putting out podcasts, whether it's making documentary films, whether it's doing live talks, whether it's producing graphics, making flyers, whatever your skill is, printing t-shirts with impactive messages on, whatever it may be, everyone should be doing something. I don't see anything exceptional about what I do. It's just what I recognize I must do. And I'm drawing on the skill sets and the experience that I've had in my life doing radio shows, being a DJ, touring, getting, you know, getting out there and addressing large crowds. That's what I do. Everybody else can be doing something. Everyone's got some skill to offer. Everyone's got some quality that they can be putting to use in this battle, in this war. So there really is nothing special about what I do. It's just that I've been very successful with it. I've clearly woken up a lot of people. I know this because I get emails every single day from people all over the world. And they say, thank you so much for your output. Your content has really impacted on me. It's caused me to change my entire 
mm. outlook, my worldview. I've changed my behaviors and my lifestyle and in some cases my job as a result. I now speak out to other people, which is great to hear. And I don't mention that because I'm coming from any place of ego. It's not about me. It's never about me. It's always about the message. I'm just simply conveying the fact that if I can have that kind of impact on that many people, and at the end of the day, I'm just a regular dude. I'm just an ordinary guy from England, no special qualifications, didn't go to university. Uh, you know, uh, I'm just someone that has embraced the skill sets that I have and and put them to effective use. And I've had great success in in waking up people through doing that. So if I can do it, pretty much anybody can. At the end of the day, I'm just a fucking DJ. Mm. I'm fascinated to ask you, Mark. Um, and again, if I do, it, it, friends at home will forgive me, I use myself as an example again. I, I've had several kind of like awakenings in life. To come out of chronic addiction, you 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 you, you have an enlightening moment. I think they call it the epiphany, and I think you probably have a few of them. If I was to be honest, um, and the whole dance thing really woke me up to, you know to cut through the class barriers that my parents' generation had put upon me. You know, that you got like a a lawyer and a banker, they're, they're like up there and you've got your your, your refuse collector there. To, and yet you're in a dance club, you know, shaking a mean old groove and you've got your lawyer there and you've, you've got your refuse collector there and you're all like, yay, right? It was big, but... There was one thing in particular, and again, we've got to be careful what we say here, so I'm just going to kind of skirt around it. But there was a certain uh, events about 20 years ago that happened in America. They're very, very significant events, folks, you know. And there was one particular part of that event where it just, it didn't make sense. Um, this, uh, if we call it a collapse, was alleged to have happened and it physically went again any law of not just physics but but like human reasoning and it bugged me for ages and, and myself and and a couple of close friends of mine we kept it's amazing when you're in that phase because you're constantly going no i can't be right I can't. Could it all be a lie? Could, but there was that one particular event. I know you know what I'm talking about, Mark. You know, there's a certain... Uh, yeah, 8, 10 plus 1. Yes. It was that particular thing that was physically impossible from what the mainstream would tell. No, no, no. It's exposed it. it it's given the, the key in the lock for anyone who cares to, to then delve deeper and expose. And that's like it. literally what I did. I'm, I'm, I'm a lifelong learner. I want to find out about life because probably to answer my own questions, Mark, you know, and it was that one thing that was, you couldn't go back on that, you know, and I'm just wondering for yourself, was there, you know, a, a monumental moment in your life? No, not really. There was no one single catalytic event. It was a gradual process with me. Mm. And to my eternal shame, in 2001, when those events occurred that you've just mentioned, uh, to start with, I bought the official story. You know, I was under societal mind control, the same as anyone else, and I knew no better back then. So for a short period, I actually bought what we were being told. You know, it, it really uh, shames me to think back uh, to, to being in that sort of state of consciousness now. But as the years progressed, of course, I came to realize that there were so many discrepancies and uh, anomalies with what we were being told there. And then, of course, I discovered the truth about so many other aspects of life and uh, embarked on the, the path that I ended up going on. But uh, it was a gradual process with me. Uh, there was no one single event there. Had you been, if I don't want to get personal and you don't have to answer anything you don't want, Mark, but I think for me, you know, I had a very challenging childhood and there was a deep scented resentfulness of like authority. You know, I don't, I don't freaking trust it. I still have a problem around adults today. I'm a bit scared of them, mate, if I was honest, you know, right. uh, which is why I'm lucky to meet people like yourself who don't scare me at all. 
folks, <laughs> you know, but I, I, I really, and it was, it was that, I think that spurred me then to see that the extent of this huge lie that, that I, I kind of related it to the, the wrongness that I'd experienced in, in your, what I perceive was wrong, wrong, you know, things move on, things move on folks. But did, did you have like a rocky background or, or, or did, you know, were things all sort of gravy? No, not rocky in any way, really. Uh, very boring, actually. Uh, my childhood was uh, quite ordinary. I was an only child. I was very quiet and shy as a child. Uh, didn't have many friends. Wasn't very popular in school. I was always pretty much an outsider. You know, I was never one of the popular kids. I never uh, got selected for any of the sports teams. So I was sort of on the outside looking in, in many ways. So I suppose that made it easier for me to go against the grain in my adult life and uh, stray away from mainstream society. I was never into the same movies as everyone else. I grew up in the 70s and all the other kids at school loved the first Star Wars movie when it came out. And I didn't even go and see it. Oh, and I think no. I've only seen it once to this day. And Many people watching this are going to be horrified to hear this, but I just don't see the appeal of the Star Wars movies. They just never got to me in that way. Uh, and I was also around when punk rock first emerged. And there was one particular friend of mine that lived in the same street that got into the Sex Pistols when we were, we were seven years old. And he went out and bought all the Sex Pistols records unbeknown to his dad. Uh, he had to keep it a secret from him, otherwise he'd burn them. Uh, but I was never into that. I, I never sort of gravitated towards those sort of fads and trends. It was different with the Acid House rave scene, because in 1988, I was 18 and I was rife for man manipulation. So when that scene came along, I was very much entranced by it and I very much gravitated towards it and got embroiled in it. Uh but other than that, I've been someone that uh, doesn't really go with trends in society. So I don't watch TV. I've never watched TV. Uh, I'm not into football. Uh, I'm just not into stuff that the masses are into. And I never have been. So my childhood didn't have any uh, particular hardships. I've spoken to so many people in the work that I do that have had terrible backgrounds. And, you know, some of their stories just shock me uh, in terms of what they've been through and my heart really goes out to them because I never I never went through anything like that myself uh, I just had a very boring uh, childhood and upbringing and I never really felt like I belonged anywhere from the earliest age I've just felt like I've never belonged in this place generally you know the world this reality I can remember being about four or five years old and looking at myself in the mirror and just thinking what am I doing here I shouldn't be here. This is a mistake. And clearly, I incarnated into this life at this time to be doing the work that I'm now doing. It's very, very clear to me now that that was the case. Mm. But back then, I just didn't know. And I just had difficulty fitting into to things. And uh, I think it was all essential grounding. We all go through these experiences to take us to where we need to be. It's training. That's what it is. You know, it's getting us ready mm. for our real work. There comes a point in our lives where we realize what we're here to do and we have to roll up our sleeves and knuckle down to it and get the work done. And there would have been a period of training, of getting us ready for that process. And it takes many different forms. With each of us, it will be, you know, a different process. With me, I had to become a music fan. I had to get to know a lot about the music industry. I had to get out there as a DJ, being a part of the industry, playing this music. I had to be doing radio shows. I had to get used to interviewing artists. And uh, I had to travel and do DJ gigs all over the place to get me ready for what I'm now doing. And uh, this is it, you know, shit is real now. It Can we just say, real. just say there, Mark, because you describing your feelings of, uh, let's just call it isolation as a as a kid. Uh, you no different to me, mate. And I, I, I just want to say to anyone watching, young people, old, old people, that's a we're all unique. You know, it's a special thing. Once you find your purpose in this world, you'll 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 get, and to not follow the crowd and to be different. 
that's a gift. It's a badge of honor, mate. Yeah. Wear it with pride. Exactly. The other thing Mark I wanted to mention is I use the Star Wars. I was like yourself. All the kids in my class, it was 1976, if I remember rightly. My, it, 77, it, I think. 77, yeah. They all went to see it. Um, we we didn't, basically. <laughs> so Aren't people going to be horrified to hear that? You know, fans of that franchise, they're going to think, what the fuck? What is wrong with you guys? Yeah. How were you not feeling that film? They but he, Mark, here's the irony is years later when when it got to like videos and uh, 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 VHS and uh, I I think I just hired a copy from the shop and like you did in them days when you, you got your money's worth, didn't you? You watched it, then you went, right, should we watch it again? And you, you could chain watch films. The beauty of that whole thing now is, you know, this thing, this this Luciferian doctrine where they've got to show you what they do before they do it. Hen right. Hence why we saw, you know, the events we've talked about, you saw a lot of stuff mentioned in like the Simpsons. In hundreds and, and hundreds of movies. Yes. Revelation of the method. But the thing with Star Wars, it's a great uh, representation. I don't even want to say a metaphor or maybe that is, but it, it's, it's the Kundalini experience. It's enlightenment. You're talking, you've got your dark side there, which is what I call the big club, the the people that are pulling the strings, folks. And then you've got your young Luke Skywalker there that doesn't realise he's also got that power. They call it the force, don't they? The force. And the force doesn't have to be for the darkness that these, the force can be for good and, and, and should be for good hmm. and it, it, it that metaphor mark obviously is lost on the masses but it's so obvious even the colors the black of darth vader the white of luke skywalker it's an allegory that's and, the word and, and they do this with so many movies you know in star wars I've, I've since watched it so i have seen it now um they are telling you that everything's a choice and they're showing you that uh light good can overcome darkness and evil if we want it so the message is right there in that movie and this is coming from hollywood which is full of all kinds of unsavory activities as we well know hollywood is run by absolute bloody demons and yet in this vehicle that came out of that institution they're giving humanity this inspiring empowering message and it's not just that movie it's everywhere it's in most movies actually mm -hmm. most movies coming out of hollywood most blockbusters uh Avatar is another one. Uh, there's a new Avatar movie now. I'm taking my daughter to see it at the weekend. Uh, there's a message in that movie, which is talking about how we can overcome adversity and darkness and evil if the consciousness is there to do it and the will is there to do it. So there it is embedded into the narratives of these movies. And it's in TV shows. It's in uh, songs. A lot of very famous rock songs have talked about this. They talk about kundalini energy. They talk about the raising of the chrism oil, the illumination of the pineal gland, the attaining of higher levels of consciousness. It's out there in popular culture vehicles, if only people would know how to interpret it. So they veil it in allegory and metaphor, and you've got to know how to decode it. This is actually inspiring the writing process of the book that I'm putting together at the moment which is called The Gift and the Curse. It's another novel. It's the follow-up to my Cause and the Cure novel. And I've been inspired by all these things that I've mentioned, films and rock songs, to put allegorical elements into the narrative. So in my story, there's going to be a surface narrative, the exoteric for the masses. So if you're someone that just wants a bit of a gripping, thrilling read, then the surface narrative might appeal to you. But if you're someone that likes stripping away layers and looking at symbolism and allegory and decoding anagrams and hidden meanings and esoteric teachings, this sort of thing, then I've put all that in there as well. And I was very much inspired by the movies of Stanley Kubrick in this because that guy was a bloody genius. Clearly, he came from the inner circle of certain, you know, secret society fraternities, I would say to be armed with that sort of esoteric knowledge. But he put so much of that knowledge into his movies. 
So, for instance, you can watch The Shining and the exoteric representation of that movie is that it's about this guy, Jack Nicholson, who uh, is the caretaker of this remote hotel and he goes a bit crazy and tries to murder his family with an axe. OK, you know, if that's what you want to get out of the film, then that's what that film holds for you. But if you want a bit more higher minded meaning behind that film, there is so much there once you strip away that surface narrative. You know, there's endless interpretations of what The Shining is really telling us. It's not about a guy that goes crazy with an axe. It's about so much more than that. So I've got great admiration for how these stories these parables these teachings have been encoded into these movies and i'm trying to achieve that with my fiction writing now so uh yeah it's a beautiful thing when you can when you can learn how to decode these things because they're offering them up to us mm. if only we would accept them you know i think there's hidden meanings in many songs where you can take them one way or you could take them another. And one example I always give is Led Zeppelin's Stairway to Heaven. Stairway to Heaven is a very beautiful song. It's got some very inspiring elements to it. And I think ultimately it's talking about kundalini energy. It's talking about uh, that energy going up the human spinal column. That's the stairway to heaven. And when that energy, that oil, goes into uh, the center of the human brain, which is where the pineal gland resides, and this alchemical process takes place, it can result in the illumination of the pineal gland and the attaining of elevated levels of consciousness. That song is telling you all about that. That's what the stairway to heaven is. Mm. So a song can be one thing or another. A movie can be one thing or another, depending on the consciousness that we apply to it. I'm so glad you picked up on that because just when you mentioned Stay Away to Heaven, I thought Kundalini, for, for, uh, the um, first thing that came into my head. Somebody said, oh, it says My Sweet Satan in it. And I thought, oh, gosh, it's hard enough writing the music one way around. Now. <laughs> <laughs> Let me tell you something. If you're sitting around here having a good time, if you're sitting around your house playing your albums backwards, <laughs> you are Satan. <laughs> What I see from the music is in industry, or what is certainly a major facet of it, is keeping people in that birth certificate identity, keeping people in that fractured, damaged ego. Basically, you know, not 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 feeling like they're worthy. And then, of course, you've got the uh, let's just call it the Sodom and Gomorrah layers of of putting this hideous message out to young people that this is how you behave. And this is going to make, you know, if you get the implants and you you get all the tattoos, you know, again, they're pigeonholing people into this broken little box that unless you do something outstanding in life, you're a nobody, you're, a, you're you, you know, you're a loser. So, so much to un unpick there, Mark, just in itself. And I, and I want to come on, you know, and talk about the club. What the hell is all that about? Um but do you, do you have anything to say off the? I'm 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 sure well, you yeah, do. Just, just just picking up on what you've said there. The other week, I went through a load of my old vinyl records that I used to play in the clubs, and I wanted to throw down a mix on the turntables, uh, crank them up, which doesn't happen too often these days. And so I went through a whole load of '90s hip hop and a bit of R and B and and reggae stuff, all tunes that I used to play. And I threw down a mix, which I was very happy with, very fast moving mix. It's full of bangers, club bangers. But listening back to the lyrical content, I was struck by just how obvious there were agendas being pushed back in the 90s and how as someone that was so close to the music as a DJ, living and breathing it, playing this stuff every single day, it just went over my head in terms of agendas that were being pushed. It's so obvious to me now to listen back. So all the mainstream output from that decade was concerned with either promoting criminal lifestyles. So all the hip hop lyrics are talking about slinging crack, uh, running guns, uh, rolling in gangs, doing stick ups and drive bys, all this sort of thing. And when it's not that, it's all about the glorification of materialistic lifestyles mm. and consumption. So 
Puff Daddy and Bad Boy Records were very responsible for this. You know, popularizing the idea of drinking Cristal up in the club, rocking an expensive suit, women in uh, expensive dresses and uh, designer shoes and uh, gold rims on your Jeep and gold chains and all this sort of thing. And uh, those messages are horrific when I listen back to them now, because Mm -hmm. what's being put out there to the young people listening to this music is that if you want to be successful in life and accepted, and if you want your life to have any kind of meaning, you've got to be rocking these brands. You've got to be drinking this champagne. You've got to be rolling in these sort of cars, you know, disgraceful messages. And I couldn't see it at the time because I was just subject to the programming in the same way that Mm -hmm. young people in every generation are. And that music, so-called, you can't even call it music anymore, that which masquerades as hip-hop and R&B these days, has moved on to pushing other agendas. So trans this, trans that, you know, uh, certain social engineering agendas. And satanic stuff as well, just straight ritualistic, satanic, luciferian imagery is getting pushed through those scenes now. Uh, But it passed me by back in the day until I learned to be able to interpret the symbolism and the obvious signs that were there. So we've got master social engineers, psychologists, behavioral scientists on the payroll that are devising ways to weaponize popular culture and entertainment against people, against the masses, to implant certain ideas into their subconscious mind. And this leads us in to the symbolism, all these signs and symbols that we see A-list artists doing. That all happens for a reason, because it's getting absorbed by the subconscious mind of the viewing public. The conscious mind is not engaged, particularly when it's entertainment. If you're watching a movie or listening to some music or you're out to see a band, you think you're just having some fun. You think it's all just harmless entertainment. That's when they get you. That's when they implant the messages and the programming in your subconscious mind because your guard is down and so they're implanting all these signs and symbols and sigils and they all carry energy because everything has a resonant energetic frequency signature to it so a sign carries energy and certain energetic frequencies sync with certain others and That's why they do this predictive programming, this revelation of the method that you mentioned, where they'll place depictions of something that they want to bring in to physical reality in a movie or a TV show or a music video, because they recognize that millions of people making an energetic connection with what they're seeing on the the screen can help sync their vibrational frequency and their consciousness with the event in question. And it can actually help to manifest it into physical reality. That's why they love doing these events with large audiences. Might be the Super Bowl halftime show or the MTV VMAs or the Grammys or these huge stadium concerts with these big A-list artists. Because they're ways of bringing in a television audience in the millions, the multiple millions in many cases. That's a lot of hearts, minds and souls rife for manipulation. But the good news comes from the fact that we recognize this now. There's so many of us on the case. Many, many researchers, many people that I've learned from, all the stuff that I I know, I've learned from others, you know, other filmmakers and bloggers and writers, authors. Vigilant Citizen is a great site. I learned a lot from that one early on. And they're all over this now, you know, An event will happen, maybe it's the Eurovision that we had the other weekend, and there'll be vigilant researchers all over it, picking it apart, showing you what the symbolism means, telling you what the significance was of this artist coming on stage in this particular way or wearing this costume or doing this particular gesture. Uh, They're all over it. So the cat is out of the bag. There's so much recognition of these old tricks, these old mind control tactics that the controllers have been using for decades or even centuries. And the public have just been falling for it en masse on a subliminal level, but they're not falling for it anymore. I mean, the majority obviously still are, but there are large numbers now who are awake and aware to this stuff. And they know what to look for. They know what the signs and symbols mean, and they've resolved not to be Mm. fooled in the same way that they used to be. 
And that's just a process that has to con continue. It has to be ramped up. Those of us engaged in this work and exposing this stuff just have to double down and, and work ever harder to get through to uh, new people and get them to see ways in which they're being manipulated. Something which I always say to people when I'm trying to get them to towards certain realizations is, do you like being mugged off? Do you like being a chump? Do you like being treated as a fool? Who's going to answer yes to that question? Who are you ever going to meet that's going to say, yeah, I'm okay with being a chump. I'm okay with being considered a profane idiot, a moron. Nobody likes to think of themselves in that way. So if you can make people see that that's the way the controllers see us, they think we're all profane, ignorant, golemized morons. They like to lump the likes of you and I and people watching this video in with the masses, the NPCs, the morons, the normies. They just see us all the same. And many people don't appreciate being looked at in that way. I think that could be the key to getting through to young people, teenagers, people in their early 20s. Just by asking that simple question, do you like being treated as a chump? If you don't, you might want to look at the ways in which popular culture and entertainment is treating you as just that and assumes you to be just that. And if you don't want to be viewed in that way, and if you want to step out of the chump mug zone and become an informed, empowered individual, then there's information you can look at that can help you to achieve that status. I think if we can find a way of getting that empowering message out to large numbers of young people, possibly on TikTok, because TikTok is the platform, you know, that's mm -hmm. the one where all the, the young people hang out and communicate with each other and stuff. Snapchat to a certain degree, but TikTok is, is the main platform. Then we could really be making some progress. The social engineers, the controllers, they want the minds and the souls of the young people. But those of us on Team God, Team Humanity, Team Creation, we want their hearts and their souls as well and their minds. Uh, and we want them for benevolent purposes. We don't want to mm. control and uh, dominate them. We want to liberate them, make them free. So there's a battle on, you know, the dark occultists, the controllers are after this group. And us who stand on the side of truth are after this group as well. So it's a question of who's going to get to them first and who's going to bring them over to their mm. respective side. You know, my take on it, the way I explain it to people, and you're welcome to, you know, come in on this, but I say, folks, there's so many incredibly talented musicians in the world, singers, da da da. Go to an open mic night, you're going to see five people get up in a pub, half pissed, and they all deserve a record deal. You know, such beautiful, beautiful voices and, 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 and rhythm, et cetera, et cetera. The music industry then they they sign these people up they give them a taste of success and then they knock them back down again they knock them down into the pits they make them in some celebrity scandal da, 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 da. and then they bring them back up and then this is that i think where they sign the you know quote unquote faustian pack i uh, i say that because like i don't actually think people sign their names in blood folk but um, and then that's why you see some really good people uh, of which I'm, you know, I, I, I know these people. And the next thing they're coming out with like an advert for take your family down the clinic and get them all into the old. Pr you, and you're like, dude, what are you doing? Yeah. And of course, it's obvious what they're doing. If they don't do it. They've it's... been pulled back into line. Yes. Or... Maybe they've had a threat made against them. We don't know. You know, it can mm. be a, a very empowering thing to have a personal threat made against you or a family member. So we don't know if that's going on behind the scenes. Exactly. Mark, listen, I'm acutely aware of the time. You've been so kind to give us. Good luck with a book, mate. Your third third in the series. Well, the, the, the current book is my novel, which is the follow-up to The Cause and the Cure. So this one is my second work of fiction. 
but I've got my three musical truth books. And I did put out a book way back in the day, actually, when I was still a full time DJ, it came out in early 2007 mm-hmm. called Tales from the Flip Side. That's like my forgotten piece of work. It's sort of a, a rarity. There's only about three copies in the world, I think. But this is actually my sixth book now. Good credit to you, mate, because I know what it what it takes to write a book. It's a it's a stunning effort. But uh, we'll put links to Mark's books below this video. So I strongly suggest you you grab a copy because there's so much information in there that will that ties in with probably a lot of you know um, a lot of other stuff that you you may or may may not have learned. Um, Mark, that just leads me to say much love to you, brother. Thank you so much uh, for coming on the show. Thank you for your um, committed input for the children. Everyone at home, much, much love to you too. If you could like and subscribe, we'd really appreciate it. We're trying to bring you the chats you're not really going to hear in too many other places. And do you know what? It's quite enlightening. <laughs>